Hello, my name's Emily Roycroft, and I'm very happy to be talking here as part of the SMBE Fitch Symposium and the first online Fitch Symposium, which is very exciting. I did my PhD at the University of Melbourne with my supervisors Kevin Rowe and Adnan Misali, and today I'll be talking about my work using museum genomics to reconstruct the recent extinction of native rodents in Australia. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge that today I'm speaking from the land of the Ngunnawal people and that I conducted the work I'll talk about today on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Boon people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge them as the traditional owners of these lands. As you may know, Australia has some of the most unique biodiversity in the world and especially very unique mammal diversity. As well as the famous marsupials, we also have many species of native bats and native rodents. But unfortunately, Australia also has the worst rate of recent mammalian extinction in the world. So where 1.5% of the world's mammal species have become extinct, 11% of Australia's mammals have become extinct. And this number has just been steadily increasing with time. So you can see here there's been 30 native mammal extinctions in Australia since 1788 and 1788 is significant because it's the date of arrival of Europeans into Australia and along with that came the introduction of feral predators like cats and foxes as well as changes to traditional land use like more uh, agricultural use, land grazing um, and as well in some cases the beginning of bounty hunting for a number of native mammal species and all of these different factors came together to significantly impact Australia's native wildlife. Native Australian rodents have been disproportionately affected by this recent extinction. So you can see that native rodents make up 19% of Australia's terrestrial mammal diversity but 47% of recent mammalian extinctions in Australia. So there appears to be something about native rodents that makes them especially susceptible to the threatening processes that I just mentioned. For the vast majority of these species, they went extinct prior to around 1900. So what that means is we know very little about the distributions, population size, biology, ecology, behavior of most of these species. I won't name all of them because there's many, but here are some examples from pictures of specimens and from drawings. But fortunately, most of these species were collected alive at least at some point, at least one specimen, and were lodged um, in collections in museums, and that's how we know that they were historically extant. So one of the themes of my research and the theme of the talk today is the use of museum collections as genomic resources. New technologies allow us to obtain DNA sequence data from very old specimens and what this can do is unlock the genomic data from extinct species and allow us to gain insight into the biodiversity that we've lost. So what insight can museum genomics provide us about Australia's past and present biodiversity? Well, I think there's some really fundamental unresolved questions that we may be able to answer with genomic data from some of these specimens that are housed in museum collections in Australia and around the world. One of these questions is whether extinct Australian species were already in decline prior to 1788, the arrival of Europeans, or whether they went from relatively stable populations to completely extinct in less than 200 years. There's some evidence from other charismatic species like the thylacine and the Tasmanian devil that there may have been longer term Holocene declines on mainland Australia as a result of the arrival of the dingo around 3,500 years ago, but we have no information about these patterns for any other species. Another unresolved question is whether extinction has been random, or is there something about species, their phenotype or their environment, which can predict the chance of them declining severely and eventually becoming extinct? And we have some clues from previous studies about this, but we've never been able to place extinct species in a phylogenetic context using their genomic data before, and that's really key to asking these sorts of questions. <laughs> 
And finally, how evolutionarily distinct are extinct species from the closest living relative? So this we don't really know for the majority of extinct species, especially without a phylogenetic context. And understanding this is really fundamental in knowing how much distinct evolutionary history has been lost through recent extinction in Australia. To get at these questions, I used a genomic approach. And to get that genomic data, I had to um, collect a large number of subsamples from museum specimens. So for this study, I collected subsamples from over 300 specimens. And that was a mix of traditional study skins, skeletons, and contemporary specimens. I used a standard NGS library prep procedure for exon capture, but for the historical specimens, this was um, modified with some ancient DNA procedures. And I sequenced both a phylogenetically su uh, informative subset of 1400 loci using a probe set that we designed for this project. Um, as well as whole exomes using a whole exome capture probe design. So what this left me with was large amounts of genomic data from a large number of specimens. And I've used these data from more than 350 specimens and 1400 loci to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree of all of the rodent species in the Australo-Papuan region. This is a radiation called the Sahul hydromyini. But nested within the Sahul hydromyini is the endemic Australian clade. And this is the clade of interest for looking at extinctions. And when we zoom in, here they are. You can see some pictures of these species along the side. But you can also see their IUCN status that I've shown in these little coloured boxes. So for those red boxes, they're the extinct species. And what you'll notice is that the extinct species are not clustered in one group. They're pretty spread across the phylogeny. And this tells us that extinction has been essentially random with respect to phylogeny. And it also turns out that this is the case when we test this statistically. So coming back to these three questions, the first one was whether extinct rodents were already in decline prior to the arrival of Europeans into Australia in 1788, or whether the onset of their decline occurred post this event and occurred therefore extremely rapidly. We can get information about uh, the population size of species prior to their extinction by looking at specimens that were collected and estimating the amount of genetic diversity from those specimens prior to extinction. So essentially by calculating the heterozygosity of even individual specimens, we can get a minimum estimate of the amount of genetic variability in that population at the time the specimen was collected. So using whole exome data here, which is around um, a filtered data set of around 13,000 protein coding genes, I've estimated the heterozygosity for all of the native Australian species in this radiation. And in grey dots, you can see um, these are data that have come from species in large or geographically connected populations. So those are more likely to have higher heterozygosity because there's more variability in the population and just a greater population size. And in the gold dots, you can see species that have come from small and geographically restricted populations. So, of course, you would expect them to have smaller population sizes and therefore smaller heteros uh, lower values of heterozygosity. Um, but what you can also see in the red dots are extinct species. And these are the extinct, the specimens of extinct species that were collected at the dates listed. And we don't know the exact date that any of these species went extinct because they weren't monitored to that extent, but we do know that these specimens were collected very shortly before their extinction. What these results suggest is that the level of genetic variability in these specimens, in these populations, was comparable to that of, of extant species in large and geographically connected populations. So what this tells us is that extinct species did not exhibit critically low genetic diversity at their last specimen collection date, and that their decline likely doesn't predate the impacts of European arrival in Australia.
So this really highlights how rapidly these species went extinct. They were in potentially large populations within the last 100 and 150 odd years um, and very suddenly they disappeared. So the second question was whether extinction has been random or whether there are phenotypic or environmental predictors. So now that we have a phylogeny using high resolution phylogenomic data, we can use comparative phylogenetic approaches to test this. So here I've mapped the extent of range collapse for each of the species in this radiation, where the most extreme value is extinction. And we can ask whether the chance of becoming extinct is correlated to factors like body size, biome, the density of human inhabitation, or microhabitat. What I found in these analyses using a phylogenetic comparative approach was that both body size and biome were significant predictors of extinction risk in Australian rodents. So it was the case that larger bodied species were more likely to have become extinct or su suffered severe decline, and also species in the arid and mesic biome were more likely to have gone extinct than species in the monsoon biome. Um, and finally, how evolutionarily distinct is each species from its closest living relative? So again, this is something that we need a phylogeny to answer. And here I've plotted the phylogenetic path length between um, sister species pairs so what this essentially approximates is the intraspecies interspecies continuum. In grey squares are extant species that are species level divergences and in the white boxes are um, within species divergences. So what you can see at the upper end of the scale, the red diamonds, are extinct species and a number of those are quite evolutionarily distinct compared to their closest living relative which suggests that there's been quite a significant amount of unique evolutionary history loss through their extinction. But in contrast to that, down at the other end of the spectrum, at the within species divergence level amongst those white boxes, is another little diamond. So what's going on here? Well, this is suggesting that whatever this extinct species is falls within within species level divergence to some other persisting species. This is Gould's mouse, Sodomy's Gouldi. And what this result suggests is that Sodomy's Gouldi is the same species as a persisting species, Sodomy's Fieldi, the shark bay mouse. This is the shark bay mouse, and what my results suggest is that the Gould's mouse, which was previously thought to be extinct, still persists in this population that has been known as the shark bay mouse. This might sound like a good news story, but my results really highlight how dramatic the collapse of this species has been in less than 150 years. This species is now restricted to a single island off the coast of Western Australia, and you can see on the map how wide-ranging this species was prior to the impacts in recent decades. This really highlights using distributional records, those results that we saw from the heterozygosity, that species can be wide ranging and potentially large and stable population sizes, but rapidly decline to extinction in less than 150 years. So in sum, using genomic data from both extant and extinct Australian species, I've been able to determine that extinct Australian rodents declined rapidly following European arrival into Australia and didn't have any evidence of pre-existing low genetic diversity prior to this point. Using phylogenomic approaches, I've determined that Gould's mouse and the shark bay mouse are in fact the one species and highlighted a continental collapse for this species in less than 150 years. And more broadly, these results show the value of museum genomics and just how much we can learn by studying even small numbers of specimens of species that we've otherwise lost to extinction. I wanted to say thank you to my supervisors, Kevin Rowe and Adnan Musali, as well as um, our other collaborators on this work and the funding organisations that are listed here.
And I want to thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions in the chat and on Twitter.